We have creation, we have perfection, then we have the fall. And the fall of man in Genesis 3, as I've said many times before, is the most disastrous moment in the history of mankind. But I think the true horrors of what happened in Genesis chapter 3 are what we see in Genesis chapter 4. The story of the two brothers. We know the story, don't we? They come before God with an offering. The younger brother brings an offering of the fat portions of the lambs before God. He just brings a very appropriate and good offering. He was a shepherd. It would be very natural. Cain also would be very natural. He was a man of the ground, so he brought fruit, if you will, from the ground and presented it towards God. And God looked down on Abel's offering with favor, but he did not look on Cain's offering with favor. And once the offerings had been made, and once God's feelings had been made known about these offerings, Cain responded by being downcast, jealous, or as Scripture says, very angry. And as we know, the result was that Cain murdered his little brother. But I want us to look at those verses of Scripture right before Cain did this awful act. Verses 6 and 7 of Genesis chapter 4. Because God gives Cain a warning. He says, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted, says the Lord? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So in looking at these verses today, these very important verses, we will remember that, first of all, sin does continue to crouch at our door. But that God has said, we must rule over it. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, oh, how I thank you for this morning. I know it's tough on these mornings where suddenly we're getting up an hour early and all these things, but Lord, you have something in store for us. I thank you for the offerings that have been given this morning. They've been tremendous. And now, Lord, as I dig into this portion of Scripture, I pray that I may represent it in the way that you desire. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we're ready to accept some truth, perhaps some of us truths we don't want to listen to when it comes to our lives and the way that we deal with sin. Simply put, let us be honest with our souls this morning, I pray, to open our hearts, open our minds, and prepare us for your word. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the image that God gives to Cain as he talks about sin crouching at his door is kind of the, the image of an animal, is it not? Perhaps a lion lying in wait. Some versions of Scripture say that sin is lying at the door. Others say crouching. But this crouching gives an idea that the, that the, the animal, the lion, is ready to pounce. Uh, Peter talks about this in 1 Peter chapter 5. 
uh, where he says, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a lion looking for someone to devour. That's the image we have here. Uh, And to devour means to consume destructively. So Cain, he's been well warned that whatever he's going to do is going to be detrimental to him. Now, for a long time, I've looked at this portion of Scripture and others, and I've seen it as a story of avoidance. Sin is crouching at this door, therefore I must exit from that door over there. But that's not what God says, is it? He doesn't say turn away and run from it. He says you must rule over it. You must rule over it. Simply put, sin is a part of who we are. It's something we will always have to contend with and deal with. It will always be an issue for us. So we have to recognize it for what it is. And we must rule over it. Spiritual gift-wise, it would be the spiritual gift of self-control. After all, God did say to Cain, as he says to us, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? We talked about acceptance last week, if you recall. About God being our Father and about how we are co-heirs with Christ. But the caveat here for Cain, the caveat for all of us, is that we have to do what is right. Now for Adam and Eve to do what is right was to live in the Garden of Eden, to enjoy all the splendor, and to stay away from that tree. But they failed miserably, didn't they? And they were given a warning because it says in the chapter earlier, in Genesis, uh, or two chapters earlier, in Genesis 2, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. They can't say God didn't warn them. You see, the point is, we can't play around with sin. We cannot play with it. Commissioner Brengel wrote, if God does not hate sin, he is not holy. If God does not hate sin, he is not holy. If he does not condemn sin, says Brengel, he is not righteous. And if he is not prepared to punish sin, he is not just. Adam was warned. Cain was warned. We are warned. God hates sin, period. There's no way around it. There's no playing with it. There's no hoping at the pearly gates we can persuade him. God hates sin, period. It causes separation. He's a holy God. He cannot look upon sin. He is set apart, and so he's created this way that we can attain his likeness, that we too can be set apart, that we can enjoy fellowship in that sense, making us acceptable to him. We must also remember that God is just. His sense of justice and truth will always be administered. Sin is sin, and it will always be exposed for what it is. And our just God will judge our actions for what they are. I think it's here we have to be a a little careful. Because sin is a separation from God. And our just God will judge our lives, our actions, our motives. Some people got some weird thoughts about judge, by the way. I saw one of those afternoon TV shows once where somebody was talking about folk who were judging and they said, well, you know, if you're a Christian, you can't judge because God doesn't judge. No. (laughs) We don't judge because we're not just. God judges because he is. We have to be very careful with this. Because the lessons that we learn in this life, the punishment that we get in this life, we need to learn from those punishments. We need to learn from those moments because, of course, at the end of it, there will be eternal punishment. Eternal separation from God. That's too much for any of us to bear. Our God is holy, our God is just, but our God is also righteous. And our righteous God wants to make sure that we have all we need in order to do what's right. God's wrath is against sin. And when you think about how many religions there are in the world, and there are many religions, and many people worship gods and uh, and what have you, and, and many of them, we might consider to be harsh or vengeful gods. There are people who will say the God of the Old Testament is a harsh 
and vengeful God. But I would disagree with that. Because I think there's a remarkable consistency through the Old Testament and the New Testament. Because in the Old Testament, the consistency of God was shown in his hatred of sin. And in the New Testament, the consistency of God was shown in the hatred of sin. The difference between the two, of course, was the arrival of Jesus Christ as our Savior. And through that hatred of sin and through his dealing with it, he shows to us his mercy and his grace. Even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. His mercy and his grace. Now, that doesn't mean that sin has been eliminated. What it means is that sin's hold on us has been eliminated. It still crouches at the door. It still wants to devour us. But through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we have the ability to rule over it. We talk a lot about peer pressure. I mean, we've got children, so we talk about peer pressure. And when I was a kid, we talked about peer pressure. And to be honest with you, when I was a, a young man at school, I didn't struggle too much with peer pressure at school. Yeah, kids did drink. Yeah, there was the group that smoked down by the tennis courts. Uh, quite frankly, drugs was never something I remember being an issue when I was young in England. But these other things went on. In fact, the only kid that gave me any grief about being a salvationist, and everyone knew I was, the only kid was the YPSM's daughter from another call. Go figure. <laughs> However, I did experience peer pressure from my fellow salvationists. Huh. The kids who were about my age. I've got to be careful what I talk about here. My mum's sitting right in front of me today. <laughs> you see, on a Friday night, I was the assistant youth club leader. I assumed that responsibility when I was about 16 years of age. And so, as I was about 16 or 17, I think I was at this point, there was a group of my friends that would meet at the court on a Friday evening. So there's me running the youth club inside the building. On the outside, this group of friends would meet, and they'd go hang out for the evening. And I watched this go on for several weeks, and never once did they invite me. So I went to one of them. I said, well, I see you guys coming every Friday night. And you guys go and have fun, and you've never invited me. They said, well, that's because we meet. And then we go down to the Belgrade Theatre. It's a little theatre at the end of the road. We go down to the Belgrade Theatre. We go to the bar in the Belgrade Theatre and we have a drink. And we know you wouldn't drink. So I looked at him and went, well, I might. <laughs> okay, he says, next week, come and join us. So the next Friday I did. They gathered outside. I said to the youth club leader, I'm not your assistant tonight. I'm going out with my friends. We went down the road, we went to the Belgrade Theatre. We went up to the second floor, and there they have a bar. And the seats were arranged in a semicircle. Now understand this, I had never drunk alcohol, so I'm thinking, what do I drink? I don't really know what they are. So I, I, I was thinking of a very mild British alcoholic drink called a shandy. A few folk would know what a shandy is. In my mind, I'm going, shandy, 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 that's what you're going to drink, a shandy. All the time in my mind, I'm thinking this word, shandy. So we sit in our little semicircle, and someone starts asking what we want to drink. Shandy, 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 I'm thinking. Mike, what do you want to drink? Coke! <laughs> it came out just like that. It was the oddest thing. But I drank a Coke. I don't know, but that may have been one of the most important moments in my life. Because if I'd had that drink, there would have been another and another. And the probability is at least my relationship with the Salvation Army would have been spoiled by that moment. Who knows? With inside of me, could I have even become an alcoholic? I don't know. What I do know is this. I can stand before you this morning and say I have still never tasted an alcoholic drink. Because, through the power of God, I was able to resist the sin that was before me. The warning given to Cain is one that we must all heed. But the grace and mercy of God, through the death of Jesus Christ, means that we're capable of 
ruling over sin. I think we talk about that a little bit in our tenth doctrine. We believe it is the privilege of all believers to be wholly sanctified, that their whole spirit and soul and body might be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as I look at that doctrine, I look at the word may, and in my mind I see that word may as it, 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 it will happen if you do these things, but we still have the option, frankly, of falling away. We believe in the idea that we can reject Christ even if we're in the midst of him. Even if we are holy people, we can still turn away from him. We do believe that we can backslide. It's our choice, not his, but it's ours to have. Therefore, we must heed God's command to rule over sin. This week, I had the privilege of going to a business seminar at Camp Keystone. I say privilege, by the way, very loosely. It wasn't my choice to do that. Wednesday evening, I got in the car and drove to camp. Thursday, I sat through human resource and development seminar. Yes, that was not the day I wanted to spend my Thursday, but that's okay. It is what it is. The best part, though, were the breaks. It's like recess at school, isn't it, guys? And so in one of these breaks, I had the opportunity to talk to um, Lieutenant Ryan Mayo. Uh, Lieutenant Ryan Mayo, uh, of course, comes out of this corps. He's a fine young man. And we were having a conversation about things such as recovery. And it was a very interesting conversation for me because he, he talked about people as they fall away, as, as, they, as they make mistakes. And he said, when somebody makes a mistake, when somebody goes back to an old habit, he said, I don't ask them, what did you do? I ask them, what didn't you do? That's a great logic to that. Major Smith says, I know all about that. But for me, that made a, a lot of sense. Because someone in recovery, there are certain disciplines. There is the spiritual discipline, which surely sits above them all to, to make sure you're in God's word and that you're praying. Other disciplines would be accountability. Another discipline would be to go to meetings, AA or, or so on and so forth. These are disciplines. So if you fall by the wayside, the question is, what didn't you do? And I think it's the same thing for us. We who are Christians, sometimes in our lives, if we look back, and I know I can, I think we probably all can, we can look at sort of times in our lives when we'd slip back a bit, not deliberately, perhaps circumstances in life, maybe stress, maybe busyness, but suddenly there's something you're not doing. Perhaps it's your time with God, your devotional time, your, your prayer time. How about your focus? What is your, your focus on? Is your focus on God? Is your focus on serving others in the name of God? Or is your focus on yourself? How about your worship? Oh, what a great morning we've had this morning. I, I mean, it really has been. But what about your worship? Do you come to worship in order to give? to God? Is that why we come? Because too often in life I've spoken to too many people who start the sentence when talking about worship is with, with, with the word I. Very often I didn't like. I, I, I. When worship is about me, it's not worship at all. You see, remember the story of Cain and Abel started with an offering. What they were bringing before God. For Abel, the offering focused on God. For Cain, the offering focused on himself. I think that was the thing that was missing from Cain's offering, you know. It was, it was any sense of this is for God. It was all about, it was about me. And yet we serve a God who gave everything for us. And his expectation is that we do the same for him. And we must do that so that we can stay by his side and we can get through this life and that we can continue to rule over sin. There's a lovely chorus. It's a, a part of actually a lovely song in our songbook. And the song is song number 427. We can look at that chorus right now. And it talks about things that might be going on in your life, things that might be somehow causing a struggle for you right now. But it also tells us what we can do. Remember, there's a warning we've been given this morning. God hates sin. God desires you to be close to him. 
And yet for some of us right now, perhaps, perhaps, we're not where we want to be with our relationship with God. We've all been there, some of us are there. And this song tells us what we need to do about it this morning. All your anxiety, all your care, bring to the mercy seat, leave it there. There's never a burden that he cannot bear. There's never a friend like Jesus. You see, this world is a treacherous one. It's a difficult one. Sin continues to be crouching at our door. This morning is a wonderful opportunity to come and to kneel at this place and to leave behind our burdens and our cares, some of those things that have taken our eyes off of the Lord so that we might remain close to him and therefore have the ability to rule over the sin that is always going to be a part of our life. Let's sing this together and please come and kneel at this place.
Heavenly Father, this morning as we come into this place and as we, we go through this time of prayer, I pray for those who have knelt at this mercy seat. You know what they brought to you this morning. And I pray, Lord, that you will meet those needs. But I also recognize, Lord, because we are all living upon this earth, this earth was so damaged by the fall of man. Because we are inheritors of that sin that was caused in the Garden of Eden. Because of that, we all struggle every day with temptation, with sin. Heavenly Father, may we continue to stay close to you. May we continue to have the ability to rule over it because of our relationship with you. Help us to recognize, Lord, just as you did, that the issue that the world has is not one of people, it is one of sin, and what sin does to people. Therefore, your righteousness is a right against sin itself. Help us to see that. That you've been able to separate us from that sin. Help us to realize, Heavenly Father, therefore, we don't have to be bound by it. Lord, if anyone is struggling with a particular sin, help them to recognize that you don't have to be bound by it. You have given us the ability to resist it to the strength that comes from you and to the grace and the mercy of the cross. Heavenly Father, if there's anyone struggling, help them to resist it. If there's anyone who feels they're not worthy, help them to realize that all are worthy. While we were sinners, you died for us. And if there's anyone here who feels burdened or bound, 